This meeting is being Mark recorded. here for Mark 2.0. Brian is my guest host and or my co-host, I should say, Brian. And Good Fritz Coleman is on the podcast today, a Media Path podcast. Fritz, we are delighted to have you on the podcast as a guest. Welcome. Yeah, Fritz. I'm so you. happy you invited me, Mark. Thank you so much. You guys do a great job. Well, you are an icon, in my opinion, in LA, and we really respect, you know, what you've accomplished with your career. Icon just means old, but thank you very much. <laughs> I've been very lucky. I've been the beneficiary of a lot of good luck in my career, and uh, I, I continue to be very, very lucky. I, I look back on it, and, and the older I get, the more I appreciate all the good cards I've been dealt in my life. I spent most of my life in the Southwest. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Philadelphia. Uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. Went to college in Clarksburg, West Virginia the first time. Went in the Navy for four years. Came yeah. out and went to Temple University in Philadelphia for a couple of years. And then launched into a career of radio and TV and comedy at that point. Well, thanks for your service. What did you study in college? I was at uh, Salem College in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Salem is a school for underachievers in high school where <laughs> there has to be a wink and a small payment to get me in there. Nice. But I, I did so poorly at Salem. This was back during the draft. You guys are too young Ooh. to appreciate what the draft was. But if you drop <laughs> below a C average in college during this period of time, you lost your college deferment and you were immediately made available to the Defense Department to serve your country. And at this time, we were in the midst of the Vietnam War. So I, I cleared that bar by a mile. I dropped well below a C average. Mm. And I got a letter from the Defense Department, come and get your physical. We're interesting, interested in hiring you for your service. So I went down to get a, this is a true story. So I went down to get my physical and I, I, I saw the handwriting on the wall. If you got drafted, you were going to Vietnam. You'd be in Vietnam in 60 days. I said, you know, I would love to serve my country. I'm very proud of my country. I just think I would do it in a non-gun oriented job. Amen, brother. So I picked up my package of clothes. I walked down the line. They had recruiters from each of the services. I walked down to the Navy desk <laughs> and signed up. Hmm. And it was the Smart. single best decision I've ever made in my life. Because in the Navy, I worked for Armed Forces Radio and Television. It gave me my career. I was in Europe for three and a half years, learning to ski in the Alps, covering the Grand Prix at Monaco, going to the Cannes Film Festival, going to Nice, all while the Vietnam War was going on. This is a hell of a way to, you know, protect your Serve country. Your country. <laughs> yeah, I love <laughs> That's it. what I was doing. Wow. So anyway, I don't know. I, I, I'm probably talking too much. but No, that, that was that, great. And I've never that, heard of their happened. incentive program, which is very effective, apparently. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Wow, that was great. Yeah. So, uh, so what were your parents? Uh, where are they from? What were they like? My parents were from upstate Pennsylvania. Actually, they were born and raised in the home of the Little League World Series, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Uh, at, it's a mountain town. It's very simple mountain people. And my parents were both of those things. My father was a salesman for uh, an international construction materials company. He, uh, they, they sold cement and stone and slag and rocks and all kinds of interesting things. And he was the vice president of international sales and did that. My mom was a homemaker and uh, they, were, they, were, they were good folks. Sounds like the American dream. Yeah, pretty nice. And they were great. I, I, let me tell you, I was born in uh, you know, th that post-war America, I'm a classic baby boomer, mm -hmm. in this beautiful, suburban area where the homes were pretty and the schools were spectacular and things were safe and you could go out and play until dark. I go go out wow. and play until my father whistled at dark and then come home. I had a pristine uh, youth. And uh, mm -hmm. so all the mistakes I've made in my life were of my own making. They have nothing to do with a bad childhood. You know, that sounds so familiar. I must have caught the tail <laughs> end of that. I watched my neighborhood be built in, in, yeah, in northern phoenix and it, it the, we did all wow. of that we rode our bikes to school we rode after we just biked it everywhere till after dark 
No, no we got them all. You know, my dog. Like no, no, we absolutely. We got so much trouble. We had a blast. But you must be astonished at how Phoenix has blown up before since you've grown there, because well, that place is just off the map now. With, mm -hmm. you know, well, I'll retire in northern Arizona someday. That's for sure. <laughs> So, yeah, it's unreal. And as a, you know, uh, weather forecaster, what do you think about Phoenix? Look at the climate. You know, the summers I, I are brutal. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't do it. You. you know, it's, it's, I think it was 135 degrees there today or something. And yeah, I remember I, the first, the first time I visited guy. Phoenix, I got the sense that this community is closer to the sun than all other communities <laughs> in America. That's awesome. Because I got up and I had to drive to the airport at like 530 in the morning. And I had to drive eastbound and I had no sunglasses and oh, the yeah. blinding sunrise sun in Phoenix was paralyzing. I mean, I literally, it is. I'm, I'm driving like this down the street. It's really, you have a different relationship with the sun in Phoenix mm -hmm. for the heat. And then you have the monsoon thunderstorms, which are crazy. And uh, it's an interesting place. Too hot. We went through all yeah. of that, didn't we? You know, one yeah. other thing that, that, comes to my attention when I first, because I lived 10 years in LA, when I first moved to LA, I noticed that in the mornings, it would look overcast, right? And then mm -hmm. like 10 or 11 a.m., like it, you you think it's going to rain and then 10 or 11 a.m. and it happened like several days in a row. It, no, it that's be, that's, it that's the classic California forecast. Morning clouds and fog, hazy afternoon sun, high in the upper 60s to low 70s. What was the question? I did that forecast from April to October for 40 years. Oh, it's the awesome. same thing every day. I love that about California. It's just that ocean mist that comes in yeah. and it's just, oh, I, I, That's I miss That's the sea it. breeze in the morning and then you have the land breeze in the afternoon. Oh. And uh, it's, it's, you know, there are only like four repetitive weather patterns in Southern California. And two weeks into the job, I had them memorized. So it was good. That's great. Yeah. Wow. So what started you on this journey? You're coming out of school. What, what, what was your goal coming out of school? Let's start well, there. Um, um, it goes back to my time in the Navy. Um, I had I had always flirted with being on the radio. I thought that would be so cool to be a DJ or something, but I never had the guts to really pursue it, or, or I, I never thought I had the talent to really pursue it. But while I was in the Navy, they gave me an opportunity to pursue it. I did a morning radio show. I did the evening newscast. I was on a ship. I was on a, a an aircraft carrier, the USS Ooh. John F. Kennedy, which was the last conventionally powered attack aircraft carrier, the last steam aircraft carrier before they all went nuclear. And they had their own television system on this ship. And we would record radio shows and television newscasts and put them on big two inch videotapes. And they would be airlifted by helicopters to the other ships of the flotilla. So I was doing, I was doing the news and entertainment for guys in the Navy. And that's how I started. And the beauty of that Navy job was that regardless of how bad you sucked, you would never be fired because you were in the Navy. And as long as you kept your shoes shine and didn't do something to subvert the United States, you had the gig. So I had the luxury of for three and a half years being able to fail miserably at my job without getting fired. Nobody can do that in real life. So I thank the Navy for giving me like a uh, um, a, a great opportunity to grow as a performer. And I get out of the Navy. I was in the radio business for 15 years. I was a DJ, a talk show host, a production director, a music director. And then when I was in the radio business, I started getting jobs emceeing at nightclubs. That's what happened in older radio days. DJs would be invited to do that. And while I was doing that, I began to write comedy material for myself just to kind of throw in interstitially while I was doing spinning records at a nightclub. And I kind of got addicted to it. And I got a little following doing it. So um, I started to work at comedy clubs in Western New York State, Buffalo and Syracuse and Rochester. And uh, then I just became completely addicted to comedy. And I decided to come out to California in 1980. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, if you wanted to pursue a career in comedy, you had to go to the comedy store. That was the Mecca. Everybody, Jay Leno and, and David Letterman and all, all the guys that performed on TV talked about working at the comedy store. So I said, I have to go work at the comedy store. So I came out here in 1980. I was woefully underprepared. I didn't have enough material. I was not funny, but I said, I have to stay here 
because as, uh, as a matter of pride until so my money runs out and then I'll go home and beg to have my old job back. But then in 1982, I was performing at the comedy store and the news director from channel four was in the audience with his wife. And I talked on stage about having done the weather in the Navy on TV, but not knowing anything about it, but they didn't care that I didn't know anything about it as long as I filled the time. <laughs> and so after the show on this Friday night, I uh, introduced myself to this man and he said, this is a true story, incidentally. I know it sounds like complete BS, but it's not. He said, do you have any desire to come to Channel 4 and do some vacation relief weather forecasting for me, filling in on weekends, filling in for guys on vacation? And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about the weather. I thought I said that on stage. He said, that's perfect. There's no weather here. This will work out great. So <laughs> he said, well, you have to audition. So I auditioned the following Tuesday. And I, got, I was told I had the job on Thursday. And then for two years, I did utility work. That is, I filled in for guys who were off and on weekends. And a couple of years later, I was bumped up to the main job. And I retired just two weeks shy of my 40th anniversary of Channel 4 a couple of years ago. I always tell people it's the greatest scam ever perpetrated since Bernie Madoff that I was able to have that job. Oh, wow. Bernie Madoff. Oh, don't get me oh, started. That's unreal. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so you're coming out of school and, um, oh, gosh. Um, after you got really deep into this, um, did, you, did you have any regrets? Like, maybe I, you know, was there any, any regrets to getting into this long-term thing? That's a great question. Um, there were times, you know, uh, the beautiful thing is, I accepted the job, even though I wanted to do comedy, I accepted the job, job at Channel 4 because I thought being on TV in LA can advance my career faster than working in nightclubs to 15 people at one o'clock in the morning. I'll be seen by more people. So I took the job. And although this job as weather person gave me steady employment, it gave me the ability to raise my three children in a steady environment, have ongoing work, I had pangs every once in a while of having been a sellout. You know, Jay Leno lived in his car for a couple of months when he moved out here. Guys suffered for their art. I never suffered for my art. I made some decisions that kept me comfortable and maybe that's just the kind of person I am. So I, to answer your question, I would have pangs of, of regret at having maybe not taken a more direct course, but the job as weatherman actually gave me more cachet in finding comedy jobs around town. So I performed, I used to do two or three shows a week, even when I had to go back and do the 11 o'clock news. So it really didn't take anything away, but as a long answer to your question, yes, I had regrets periodically, but they were short because then I would return to my home that had a swimming pool and I'd be very happy that I wasn't suffering. You know. <laughs> Did you have you know, any so aspirations to uh, get into acting? with your comedy to either be in TV shows no, or movies? I, I had some minor little things uh, and, and mainly TV reporter and weather man things, but I, I never, I never saw myself as talented in that area. Plus it's this tough to get so up cool. in front of a crowd though. That's not easy. Oh no, I, I, And I love that. I love being in front yeah. of a crowd and eliciting a response from a crowd, but it's different than acting and, uh, you know, I perform it. Very another character. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, so uh, you did that. Is there any good stories you want to share? Like what, uh, what, what are some of the peak stories out of that 40 years? I don't know, even know. Okay. Well, uh, in, in, in the weather job in 40 years, uh -huh. I had astonishing experiences. Mm -hmm. I visited every corner of our viewing area doing live shots from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border. I saw every area of Southern California, met infinite numbers of amazing people. And in the older days in local news, in, in the Channel 4 News, NBC has been the sponsor of the Olympics for years. They used to send the entire news team to the Olympics, like 150 people. Imagine the cost of that. They would never do it now, where they would send us to the Olympics and we would do all the newscasts from the Olympic venue for three weeks. Whoa. The first one of those experiences I had was Seoul, Korea in 1988, Whoa. where for three weeks, yeah. I got to spend 
doing the news and, and visiting Seoul, Korea. Then we went to the Olympics in Atlanta in 1992. Mm. And here's my interesting story about the Olympics in Atlanta. I don't know if you watched the Olympics in Atlanta. Yeah, I did. Uh, I remember. They, they had a central gathering place called Centennial Park, where after all the events of the day, the Olympic families would gather, the media would gather, the general public would gather, and you could intermingle with people. Then they had a big stage where they had bands perform and famous people would come and talk. And so we would do our broadcast from Centennial Park every night in order to do that, because they didn't allow microwave links because of the security of the Olympics. They had what are called fiber optic drops. They had six stations in this circle, which was Centennial Park, where you could go plug your camera in and do a live shot from one of those fiber optic drops. Huh. So on one particular night, I was plugged into this one that was down just to the right of the stage. We did all of our newscasts live. Uh, so we were doing the 11 o'clock news back to LA, which was two o'clock in the morning Atlanta time. And I finished my broadcast on one night and I walked back to the Quonset hut, which was our home base for the news department. And four minutes after I left my fiber optic station, the Centennial Park bomb exploded right where I did the live shot, right underneath that park bench. And the lady was killed. It was a nail bomb that destroyed a lot of property. And you remember that security oh, guy was falsely claimed, uh, yeah. uh, blamed for doing it. I, I was literally standing on that spot four minutes before that bomb went off. And it was crazy. Uh, we, we were up for two days in a row. The international media all swarmed us wanting comments. I mean, German television, Hungarian television. And we all sat around in captain's chairs, having people translate for us what the question was. And it was, it was an unbelievable experience. But here was the best part of the experience. God. So this bomb goes off and it scared the crap out of us. Us meaning the American people. And the day after the bomb went off, everything returned to normal around Centennial Park. Nobody was shaking up. People are happy. They're partying. They're having a good time. And I said to a couple of people, are you not, do you not feel uncomfortable that a bomb went off? And they still at that point didn't know who this guy was, that, that a bomb exploded. I mean, I feel like going back to my hotel and staying there and locking the door. And they said, in the country we come from, bombs go off every day. This is nothing. They said, some of these people said, we sold our homes to be able to afford to bring our children to the Olympics. Nothing is going to ruin that experience. And it was just a great feeling of understanding what people from other countries go through. And it really snapped me up about how spoiled and uh, sort of protected we are in America. It was an that, that was an interesting experience. So yeah. the Olympics, wow. I think, were my greatest news experience. My greatest comedy experience was performing on The Tonight Show with oh. Johnny Carson and Jay Leno eight times. The greatest. And I also was on with Jay Leno, uh, with uh, uh, Joan Rivers and Gary Shandling. And, uh, wow. uh, you know, Tonight Show appearances are... That's 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 the top of Mount Olympus for a stand-up comic, or used to be. It, it's not so much anymore. And opening for Ray Charles in concert at Universal Amphitheater was a big deal. Opening for Debbie Reynolds at the Orange County Performing Arts Center was a big deal. So all those little moments I've had, I've had, I had an amazing career that I'm very thankful for. That is really cool. And talking about the Olympics, I want to throw a name out there and see if you've ever heard of them. Uh, we uh, on Mark 2.0, I interviewed Jack Doles. And he does all the things for like NBC or all the local affiliates. He is a uh, uh, he's been to the Olympics since '88, Calgary. Have you ever heard wow. of him? I, I do not know him. Now you know NBC is divided into two compartments. There's local, which I was in, yeah. like the local station channel. Oh yeah, and he was he doing for a network. bunch he of uh, the network, so he was higher up than I was. No, he worked for the local. And what was funny is, get this: when I was living in LA, I remember calling my dad back when he was alive, and I'm like. Dad, uh, Jack Doles was just on NBC4, and he goes, for the Olympics. I said, did he move over to L.A.? And he goes, no, no, that he's just doing a remote thing for uh, several different stations across the country, and that's what they did. Oh, so he was like an NBC reporter. Yeah, he was for NBC time. Channel 8, but he went to the Olympics for working for multiple yeah, outlets. All, this, all the affiliates would send representatives. 
So I did not know him, but we were all down there in a big lump during that time. So. Yeah. Were you? It was, a, uh, it, was, it, it was an astonishing experience. It really was. Now, did you it must watch, have been you, amazing you watch to see the, that uh, old machine sure. work, those, those networks moving things like that. Oh, yeah. Back. Oh, wow. the production is ridiculous. They send, they send people over there six months in advance to wire those places up wow. with all the recording equipment and uh, all the technology they need. They have staffs that do nothing but stay on the road and do that stuff all the time. But the, but the amazing part of it, first of all, technologically, uh, you know, setting up a broadcast that goes global is phenomenal. But but the real eye-opening experience for me was being in this venue with representatives from 160 countries who were treating one another with respect. They were uh, inquisitive about one another's lives. They were asking questions about America, and I would ask questions about America uh, about their country. And you just have that, you have that feeling you have when you're walking to Disneyland. Why can't life be like this all the time? And when you go to the Olympics, that's exactly the feeling you have. There's so much peace and sort of uh, fellowship going on right around here. Why can't we make this last longer than three weeks? That's my big feeling. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Who else, who else did you meet that was just really, really stands out in your memory? Like it, uh, well, Someone I met a from lot another of people country. Because, that... uh, our, our station, Channel 4, was in the main NBC facility, and my office was right over the Tonight Show. The Tonight Show was on stage one, oh, where they did the Johnny goodness. Carson show and they did the Bob Hope shows. So you would see stars going into the artist entrance all the time. And when Johnny Carson did the show, before national security became an issue, and you couldn't have the doors open and people walking in and out just observing and you had to go through five layers of security. We used to go, da uh, go down to the stage and uh, stand backstage and just watch the stars get ready to go on for The Tonight Show. And because I was a comedian, I was a big fan of, of, uh, uh, of any comedians that would go on down there. And Don Rickles would perform and Don oh. Rickles knew me because Don Rickles was a big Channel 4 viewer. And so when I, when I knew he was going to be on, I would go down there. And, and Don Rickles would stand backstage at The Tonight Show and just tee off on me like he was sharpening his knives before he went on the show. Where's your weatherman, <laughs> Mr. Weatherman? And he'd just beat the oh, crap no. out of me. And I'd be laughing so hard, I'd be crying. But it was, it was fun. And we'd stand back there and there's Clint Eastwood having a beer, getting ready to go on. Th those days stopped when when Johnny left and changed. Johnny the Carson country. was the greatest of all time. And yep. I love Lena, Leno, but nobody has topped what he did since. I don't, I don't care. I, 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 I am, I am a hundred percent in agreement with you. Oh. And you know, when that really came home to me, I mean, Carson, when I was watching Carson as a kid, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be in the humor business. I just thought it was the greatest amount of power you could wield being in a room of 500 people, making offhand remarks and people are cracking up. I just thought that was just a great, uh, that was a great place to be. Seriously. And, and I, I, but I never realized the, the, uh, the talent uh, and the subliminal way he communicated with people till I listened to the old Carson shows on Sirius XM radio, where you can't see him, but you can hear him. And you listen to the quality of his voice and how smooth he was and how funny he was and the timing. And it, it made me love him even more after that. He was just, I, I agree hundred percent. He was unmatched with Jay or anybody else. I didn't know you could hear those kinds of things. I would like you to. Know, they, they, those are periodic. They don't do them all the time, but they'll oh. do like a, they'll do a one month thing where they play old Carson shows on there. And it's really fun. The really old ones, like the black and white yeah. ones are so fun to watch. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Mark, I'm sorry I cut you off earlier. No, well, no, that's... it's fine. Sorry. What was Ed McMahon like? Oh, yeah. One of the nicest people in the world. That's that's what you would he, think. He was, uh, he was uh, just a genuine person, always would stop and talk to you in the parking lot. Johnny was not that way. Okay. As a matter of fact, I have a great story about Johnny being socially awkward. Here's oh, the story. that's why we're here. Yeah. After I did the first, my first Tonight Show, uh, it was a reasonably good shot. Uh, now, again, I, I told you that That's my office is right over. What's that? 
being oh, on the Tonight Show. show. I call it you're like your comedy bar mitzvah. It's it's that the is, day you become an adult in the comedy world, and it gives you credibility with your wow. relatives and everybody else. So the day after I did my first Tonight Show, I'm walking over to the commissary at NBC, which was across the parking lot. And just coincidentally, as I was walking over to get something to eat, Johnny's pulling into the parking lot. Now, this is the night after I did my first shot. He gets out of his car and walks right by me and looks right at me, but doesn't say anything, just kept walking. And it knocked the wind out of me. I thought, oh, my God, I must have sucked so bad on The Tonight Show last night. So I turned around and went upstairs and called the talent coordinator, the guy that books the comedians, a guy by the name of Jim McCauley. And I said, listen, I have to apologize. I think I really pissed your boss off last night. He, he seemed so mad at me. I walked by him in the parking lot. He wouldn't say hello. He just kept walking. And McCauley started to laugh. And he said, let me tell you something about Johnny. He could walk past his mother in the parking lot, but he would not see a load of her. He was so pathologically, socially awkward. And his big fear was that if he stopped and talked to me in the parking lot, there were tours at NBC, he would draw a crowd okay. and that made him sweat. He just wanted to get out of his car, go to his office. It had nothing to do with you. You were fine. Wow. But until I had a chance to call him, it was a nasty 10 minutes thinking I completely tanked my first Tonight Show appearance. Amazing. Carson was really a really socially awkward guy. Mm -hmm. And to connect that to the Ed McMahon story, their last day on the air, you know, when they had Bette Midler and all that stuff, I went down, their, their offices, both Ed and Johnny's offices were below the stage. So I walked down there to say goodbye to Ed. Wow. Ed had been very nice to me and I'd done a couple of TV specials and he was a guest and wouldn't let us pay him and he was fantastic. So I went down to say goodbye. So I shook his hand and said goodbye. I'm coming back up the stairs and Carson is coming down. And I said, well, this is my opportunity. I'm gonna tell him exactly how important he's been to me in my life. So I said, Mr. Carson, first of all, doing your show was the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. But I want you to know that you're the reason I'm even standing here. You're the reason I, I pursued the entertainment business, watching you, being allowed to watch you when I was a kid with my father, and, and I was 10 years old, and, and you were so funny and charming, and you had powers that nobody else in show business had as far as I was concerned, and I want to thank you for that. And he goes, oh, you're welcome, and he kept walking. He oh, never, wouldn't even stop and just like oh. fake a greeting, like, well, thank you very much, Fritz, that means a lot, and good luck, and thank you for coming down to say, like, you know, something cordial, because I just had revealed my inner soul to him. He didn't say anything. He said, oh, Unreal. thank you, he just kept walking. Because, not because it was me personally, but it'd be, he's so painfully awkward in one-on-one -on -one situations. He's brilliant on stage in front of a group of people, but he's pathologically shy how the heck does someone like that get yeah. to that point i don't that know is you know honestly letterman i heard i i i met david a couple of times <laughs> was very much the same way david was david was pathologically awkward socially mm. do you know tom Dreesen, the comedian by any chance he opened for frank sinatra for 25 years mm. he's a he's a well-known comic he had a super bowl party and uh he was just inviting some friends, like 10 or 11 friends. And David, he invited David to come to his house to a Super Bowl party when David's show was done out here. And so he wanted to know who was coming to the party. He said, well, my, my kids are coming. My kids are, you know, and, and then a couple of neighbors and you and somebody else. Okay, fine. So the Super Bowl party happens. And like four or five extra people showed up at the Super Bowl party that Dreesen had not mentioned. So Letterman got up and left. He was so uncomfortable not being in control of that environment, not knowing who all these people were or what their intentions were. He just got up silently and left. That's even worse than my experience with cars. That's really wow. pathological. Wow. So it's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about Jay Leno? Was he the exact opposite? Really nice guy. Really nice guy. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. Yeah, you've seen so, but but you, I've seen so many interviews of Leno, but you know I've never seen any of the other two guys. Now that you mention it, I mean, you, mean, you see uh, Leno it, talking that, about cars, and you just yeah. see him talking to people in the media. But I, I yeah. don't remember any interviews of Johnny Carson. That, well, he's, has he he's been like, interviewed? You know, Jay is very uh, middle American. He's a car oh. mechanic with a talk mm -hmm. show. Oh, I love. He's him. very blue collar, which was his appeal. 
And uh, so he, he doesn't have any facade. You see what you see with Jay, very, very much. He's very nice. He's very generous. When people on his staff would get sick or they had a relative in the hospital or uh, something like that, he would always silently go get, drive over to their house and give them a check. When uh, the, uh, toward the end of his tenure, uh, they had a massive uh, budget cutback. I mean, millions of dollars in budgetary cutbacks. And Jay didn't want the staff, and he's got a staff of like 50, 60 people, wow. didn't want the staff to have to suffer a cutback. So he took it out of his own paycheck and paid them. Now, for the amount of money he's making, that's not a huge amount of money in monetary terms, but in a soulful gesture to his coworkers, that was pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, a lot of bosses yeah. just would not do that. He's a really, no. he's a really good guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, you know, I used to work at the uh, Beverly Hills Whole Foods and it was funny. He used to go in there shopping. And one time he spent 30 minutes talking to the produce guy, like the just yeah. the nicest no, he's guy. He's very social. Yeah. Very comfortable in his own skin. Those are the people I love in show business. People who are extremely talented, but they're comfortable in their own skin. They don't have to put on airs. They don't have to talk down to you. They don't have to be condescending. I'll tell you another person who's like that is Henry Winkler. Unbelievable. Sure. The nicest man on the planet without question. I remember my whole image of the Fonz being blown when he started making movies and stuff. I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow, what this happened? guy. And then I grew up and I'm like, this is probably the nicest guy on the planet. Oh, without question. He, he's, he's, a, he's, he's wonderful. My you, uh, Louise, who is my partner on the podcast, and I produced a TV show with Henry. We mm -hmm. created a show called The Couch, which was three comedians sitting on a couch, and then a couple would go, uh, come in, and they would express the problems they were having in their relationship, and these three comedians would offer them advice, mm -hmm. and it was very funny. Oh, yeah. And Definitely Comedy volatile. Central bought this pilot, so uh, we were shopping it around. And we got a chance to just sort of follow Henry around town, taking various meetings at ICM and all these agencies. And it was so much fun to watch the world react to Henry Winkler, to watch the world react to the font. The seas would part when we would go in these buildings and women and men would all come up and he would take time with every single one, look them in the eye, ask them a oh. question about their family, sign an autograph. Mm -hmm. He was always patient with them. And I, I've never met anybody like him. He, he's unbelievable. I'm old enough to understand going to school when there was only five networks on TV yeah. and talking about happy days and, you oh, know, yeah. and just talking about jumping the shark and, yeah. You know, just, it was just really season. great. You know, I, I, so you knew Henry Winkler and uh, yep. you did a sh that show with him. That must have we did a, we, he was the executive producer and we, and Louise and I were creators and uh, it was picked up by Comedy Central and uh, Comedy, Central paid, the, yeah. Comedy Central paid for the pilot. And mm -hmm. then like a month after they bought the pilot, the vice president in charge of development did hired us to do the pilot was fired. So all that stuff went in the wastebasket. But that's show business. But oh, you had, you've had most of the uh, Happy Days cast on your on Media yeah. Path podcast. Yeah. Explain that yeah. and talk about those. Share well, those we, Weezy's had a relationship with Henry even longer than me because uh, Weezy, my co-host, uh, started her own media company. It's really a great success story. And if she were here, this would make her uncomfortable. So if she's not, so I'll tell it anyway. Oh, hey, she's coming um, in. Oh, she's here. She comes in. goodness. That's oh, awesome. here we go. Perfect timing. That's <laughs> oh, she, we're not going to hear perfectly. that now. There she is. There she is. There she is. Okay. Yes. Great. Unmute yourself, girl. Yeah. There we go. There she, Excellent. There she is. We were just talking about you, Louise. This is perfect timing. We can't hear them. Oh, hold on. We can't hear you, Wheezy. Yeah. I'm sure she'll get the audio fixed. She's play she has oh. a uh, a Blue Yeti microphone and sometimes... Oh, okay. I'm going to let her tell her own story. Sure. She started a company called Premier Radio Networks. She started as a writer for Rick Dees and expanded. Hmm. And she and her cohorts developed this media company. 
uh, that just expanded. They syndicated Ray. They they syndicated Rush Limbaugh and Michael Reagan. It was a huge company, and they sold it to Clear Channel, and Clear Channel is now part of iHeartRadio. So Wheezy has this great story to tell about all that. And here she is now. She'll tell you the rest of the story. Yeah, what happened great. was I've I've been uh, on Wednesdays. I edit the show, the podcast. So I like go into this tunnel. Oh sure. And uh, I lost track of time, so I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Oh no, you're no fine. He said you. Fritz said you might not even be. Yeah, we're happy to see you. Sure, yeah. if this was one that we were booked on together. So I'm glad you're here because I'm exhausted from talking. So are we. Right. Uh, we've been hearing great stories. Yes, we we're Ask talking me. about the. Farms. But, you know, they asked me a good question. I was talking about. We were talking about nice people in the business, and I said Henry Winkler is hands down probably the nicest person we've ever met. And I also described the fact that you had a relationship with Henry far before you and I all both had one. So uh, talk, tell us about that. And yeah. they, they were mentioning that we had a lot of the Happy Days people on the show, and explain that. Well, we do. If you watch our show, if you watch the YouTube version of our show, we have a, a Fonzie votive candle. Hmm. That's <laughs> wow. You know, it just kind of like guides our way. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I've known Henry, I, I don't even know how many, I'm not good at counting, but uh, he had a, uh, a show called Sightings in, in the 80s or 90s, and it was about UFOs and ghosts. I never missed it. Yeah, devoted, of course. I, I have tattoos of UFOs. I had never missed it, like okay. ever, never. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so he came to premiere and he wanted to do a radio version of it, and then I found myself in his office on the Paramount lot talking about that. And we just have been friends ever since. So he, he, he's been kind of a mentor. If I had an idea for a show, I'd call him. And usually he'd be like, that's nice. Uh, I need to go. <laughs> like, you know, I, I adore you and I need to hang up the phone. So when I told him, when I told him the idea for, for the couch, and he actually liked it. I was like, wait, what? Are you still on the phone? Are we still having this conversation? <laughs> yeah. So he came up to my home and watched a, um, we were rehearsing it once a week. It was a, the, the concept was three comedians would help two people solve a dispute. Mm. And he- A beautifully volatile situation. Absolutely. And you know, <laughs> so all hell would break loose. Uh, <laughs> And we would, I would have my friends act out disputes, you know, pretend that, you know, that he, that your husband invites his friends to stay with you and that you'd like some privacy. And, you know, sometimes they were real disputes. Like you just kind of, we used up all our friends. Let's put it that way. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Andrew came, came up and, you know, it's called the couch. So the set is easy. Most people have a couch. We have a couch and we'd sit there and Fritz was the host. And we went and Henry liked it. So we wound up taping a, a pilot. Like we spent like a couple of weeks taping a pilot between newscasts. So like between seven o'clock and 10 o'clock, the soundstage for the news studio was kind of dark. And we went in there and put, put up a set and we taped it. And we, and one of our, the guys on the panel, James Arnold Taylor, he's now like a really hot voiceover guy, but he kind of edited it in his own home. And then we went around and chopped it. And Comedy Central said, we love the idea. We don't care for you people. And <laughs> they, they recast us with people like Doug Stanhope. And and uh, and it became kind of an angrier thing where people were just trying to get their jokes in, which understandably, because we had been rehearsing it for two years and we had this kind of chemistry and empathy. And, you know, we really wanted to solve people's issues, but they kind of just were going for the jokes. and. We put it in front of a focus group and we're behind the, the two-way glass and Henry's there and we're watching people say, they're not really solving the problems. And, and it, so it was frustrating because I had stripped the show of all of the humanity that, you know, we were proud of. And, and then well, you became like the writing team for that project and sort of. Yeah. I mean, we were the, in on the casting. Fritz and I were in on, you know, all these people that kind of, were Comedy Central greats, you know, people that had had their own one hour specials or half hour mm -hmm. specials and they're really good, uh, funny comedians. But, and they, you know, could have been great, like if they had had more time to like work out their chemistry. But in the end- It um, killed the show because as, as Weezy mentioned, it took the humanity out of it because the only reason to be offering people advice is not to make fun of them. 
and to lambast them with jokes, because we can do that without two people. They have to come away with something. There has to be a moment of empathy in there where you're really trying to help them figure the problem out. Otherwise, there's no point in having the show. They completely suck that out of the entire process. <laughs> so it didn't work. Uh, probably should have been two comedians and a PhD or something. Right? Now, there's yeah. a formula. Let's pitch that. <laughs> there we go. So you have a you have a you're a producer, you're a writer, comedian, director. Is there anything you don't do? I mean, you're all I over. Don't, um, you're I don't uh, join podcasts on time. <laughs> no, wonderful. we're hey. <laughs> no. Don't feel bad about that. We're so no. glad that you're here. We're so, thrilled. So, what's the latest? thing for your podcast which you're well yesterday we kind of challenged ourselves i mean i guess the reason I, I like i do go into this tunnel when i'm editing the show and forget um forget the rest of my life you know pretty easily but like yesterday fritz and i challenged ourselves because we had two people on who are both making their way in the tiktok world huh. and fritz and i had not really much entered i had dipped my toe in but fritz <laughs> He just downloaded. I didn't app. even take my sock off. I knew nothing about it. Right, and yeah. we had two two really good TikTokers that are more or less in our age group, like you know, fifties ish, and they're doing really well at TikTok. One is a guy who has a show called LA in a Minute, and he's mm. gone all around the Southland of Southern California, giving one minute about all these really wonderful different landmarks, historical landmarks, and he even did like he stood in front of the landmark that is Fritz Coleman. And did like a cold read of what his memorized content. I was sure that this guy was reading teleprompter, but like he stood on my it deck. It was in front shocking of how good he was. Yeah, he just rattled wow. off all these facts and names and places and dates of Fritz's whole. And it was like watching This Is Your Life, I'm sure, for Fritz. <laughs> was, you know, flash before him. But uh, so he's doing really well with LA in a minute. And then the guy that mixes our show is a guy named John Maddox, who's really found kind of a pathway for himself. Uh, in a brand, his brand is uh, creating music and sound, and it's for people mm -hmm. very, very niche. So instead of being like general, like all these sites that are interesting, his is extremely niche. It's for people that edit music, and he's done all this really cool content from inside his studio, where he's showing people how to use Logic, which is the software that he uses, and how to kind of create, you know, what plugins are awesome. And then he gets more general, like which bands are awesome and how do they create the sound and stuff. So the two of them were actually in our studio and we're used to Zoom guests. And so it was like, can I touch you? And it was, it was really cool. That was, cool. that's wow. great. One of your podcasts that stands out for me, Louise, yeah. is the one with uh, Leland Sklar. And yeah. uh, after following his channel, I was not aware. I knew him from James Taylor and Phil Collins. I was not aware that he's worked with everyone under the sun. It was funny because we just interviewed Aretha Franklin's son, Teddy Richards. And oh, he nice. said, well, he hasn't worked. I'm like, I, I mentioned Lee's name, thinking that he might have worked with him. He goes, oh, he hasn't worked with me. And he didn't know who Lee was. But he's, it, he's got a record for the greatest number of sessions, like 4,000. I'm sure sessions. his book is hilarious, too. Give him yeah, he's really everyone a, a the lovely, book. lovely man. I love Yeah, him. explain the book. Explain the book. Yeah, talk about the book, Fritz. <laughs> I didn't read the book. Oh, the book oh. was like, he took he takes pictures yeah. of people giving him the finger. That's the one that I let you borrow, Oh, no, Ryan. of course. It's, I'm it's sorry. so I funny. Was, yeah, I was like, what I is this? That. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> but he's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I like his gentle soul is like... Like that people would ever flip him off is like hilarious as a concept to begin with, right? Because he's just such a sweetheart. He's just such but a kind-hearted, gentle stories. soul. He really does. Oh, yeah. He's he's a typical creative 60s guy. And, and he's got the best stories about being back at the Troubadour and, you know, James Taylor and Carol King and going on the road with them with this reunion thing. And he's just a, he's a lovely man. He, he's another guy. Uh, of the type that we were talking about earlier, a really talented person who's comfortable in his own skin and he just draws you in, you know? Yeah. And what's so sad about him is you constantly see on his page that he's getting, uh, you know, uh, posts taken down on YouTube because, uh, you know, Warner is flagging it or something. It's so sad because it's stuff that he worked on. Yeah, on his, on his YouTube, what he does is he'll pick up his bass and he'll play along to his own bass licks. So it's like him playing. So in his mind, you know, he thinks that he, this content, he, he should be able to share this content. But if he doesn't own the copyright on it, YouTube will, you know, flag it depending on who owns the publishing or YouTube's deal with the record label or it's no. tricky. 
It, and it that's was, what we were that's what we were talking about with the TikTok guys yesterday, all that kind of stuff, how it compares to YouTube uh, censorship, because TikTok is a Chinese company and they have different standards of censorship. And both of those guys have been flagged for really innocuous stuff. And it was an interesting conversation. And it really just hit Wheezy and I to uh, the whole world of TikTok, which has taken over everything. now. Well, it shows how smart the both of you are to bring on somebody who's a TikTok creator, because Brian and I are always talking about uh, things. He's, Brian was mentioning a group called the Petersons that just lit up on uh, YouTube, on all social media platforms. What do they do? Well, they play uh, bluegrass, which I really have never been exposed to. But, you know, yeah. COVID drove them to YouTube. And uh, even, you know, and bluegrass is not overly popular globally, no. but they went to a million like this, yeah. you know, of views cool. like that on a single song, on a cover song, like an old John Denver song. They take these old songs and dust them off and they're, they're There's really something very young soothing kids. about bluegrass, soothing, and oh. it's just it's nostalgic. I, I love it. I'm actually going to look them up. I, I'd never heard of them until you Yeah, Peter Sen's, and it's at the end of it is S E N, okay. and not S O N. But the Peter Sen's are just really a great family. You know, one of those bluegrass families. They're all brothers and sisters, except for one. And um, gosh, they're just, uh, they do, you know, so many things not just covers they have originals and some gospel stuff you know and it just it has just brought me to the next uh, another place for like the last year that i never thought i would go and I, i'm really that's I'm so really, cool when you yeah. uncover like a whole new cave to explore yeah. uh yeah. that fascinates you that's really exciting yeah i had a background in music it was all rock related and stuff like that i thought i would never end up here you know but once i got older and went to i'm looking at your acoustic guitar behind you what a great room in those bongos and stuff that's the first thing i saw that's the first usually thing i saw I, I, usually i light up my room better when i when i do a zoom that but, is a great uh, room i, I, I literally sat down and went oh I think I just fogged a podcast that I'm supposed to be on. So I, I can light up the room better. But like, yeah, I play drums and, and guitar and I, I write songs as well. Awesome. You will love the Petersons. Yes, I will. I love yes. the cool. Now, what is your inspiration in finding guests? How do, how, how do you go about doing it? It's gotten down to where we have a booker. Oh, that's excellent. Um, and she also books the Tim Conway Jr. show. So when she's on the phone with folks, she'll be like, hey, would you like to do Fritz's podcast and Fritz is an icon in Los Angeles people generally say yes but Fritz and I can send her in specific directions that interest us so and then if maybe like with you guys you get hit up where people say hey we we've got a new book coming out we'd like to be on your show so it's a it's a mix and match of like us looking for folks and then folks looking for us yeah it's very similar with us Brian publishers yeah are always you know they're a very good source for us so yeah. far yeah yeah and we like to read the what book. business were you in brian were you in the music business before or are you still I, no, i'm not still i've been a musician my whole life i did a lot oh. of live shows in my uh 20s and 30s yeah. you know like i said a lot of rock you know it was a lot of um hard rock in the 80s and that kind of went to some kind of more old what they called alternative rock, you know, kind of a yeah. softer rock in the nineties. Yeah. And now I just like to, you know, do things on my acoustic guitar. And that's, the, again, YouTube is so beautiful when it comes to music, yeah. you know, I was trying to learn how to play uh, Stevie, Stevie Nicks's song, a landslide Fleetwood Mac or whatever. Wow. So, and it, and it, it led me to them doing a cover of it and i and i'm like oh well, wait these guys are really good who is this you know and ah. and so it's just you know and i was i was looking for john Den you know my i come from a long I, like i said i'm from arizona i'm from phoenix you know so mm -hmm. I come from a long line of rancher cowboy guys you know so we like john denver and stuff like that you sure. know and um yeah yeah so so it was really great how one thing led to another and um anyway uh now similarly you guys are uh you know got your podcast now and we have ours but we're really you know envious of all these great stars that you were have been able to come you know the happy days thing just blew me away can you can you give us any other little cool stories about who you've had that you're proud of 
Let's see. Well, who are we most proud well, we're of? We're proud of everybody. Exactly. Uh, what I love of course. Everybody. Of course. Of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, what I mean is we, we have a very diverse group. We love to talk politics. So we have politicians on. Mm. Oh. We, uh, we have writers of political books. We have uh, uh, graphic artists. We have one of the world's preeminent photographers on. We'll talk about any subject. I love to have conversations with people who are uh, well versed in a field that I don't know anything about. I find mm -hmm. that fascinating. Okay. So um, we we uh, we have, and then we have lots of entertainment folks because we are in LA, and Wheezy knows a lot of entertainment people. So that we we sort of have an, an in that way, and uh, we, we love to mix it up. It's what keeps things interesting. Yeah, and we like to learn like little hidden truths about c celebrities and show business history. We had a guest called Sally Hodell who's written a book about Elvis Presley that sort of she tries to explain his issues by kind of uh, doing a deep dive into the health history in his family. And her thesis is that he was self-medicating because he just never felt good. Like mm -hmm. since he was a child, he had, she, she said he had, he had disease in like nine out of the 11 systems of the body. And he was really bright. So he would read a lot about like what pharmaceuticals would be helpful. And he was self-medicating. He wasn't taking any illegal drugs. You know, we know we think of him as a pill popper, but he was taking drugs that he had read would make him feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, he just never felt well. So that was a, a really interesting re read. And she was a fascinating guest. In the 1950s, a far different world for Elvis when he's trying to medicate himself. You know, there's just uh, so much unregulated. I, 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 that must have been uh, incredibly painful. Yeah, he was uh, probably uh, a couple of things. First of all, the sadness of that and the humanity of that story is twofold. You know, he was born in adject poverty in Tupelo, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And in those days, and Sally Hodel talks about this, there was a lot of intermarriage in families. And they did that not just to be immoral. They did it because of survival. They wanted to grow their families. So when there's intermarriage, you know, the predisposition for disease grows exponentially. And so all of the Elvis's problems, including his intestinal issues, his mom had. And so all of these things she traces back in the lineage of his family, which is sad. So he was a victim of his own family tree. Second of all, he was such a slave to work because he felt obligated to take care of not only his family, but all these people he had grown up with. That's why they all moved in, you know, the Memphis Mafia. They all moved into Graceland because he felt a moral obligation to keep these people up out of poverty, never wanted to return to poverty. So he worked himself to death. Mm. And then the last thing, the dark aspect of it was this doctor who just kept you know, feeding his addictions and who knows what he was doing. But anyway, it was a really touching book. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I mean, wow, there were so many people that were that were wow. dependent upon him financially that, you know, for them, the goal was just oh, keep him healthy enough that. to go on stage tonight. Mm. Yep. I can't hear. Oh, you can't. Okay. Yeah. Well, what does the future hold for Media Path Podcast? I mean, I'm really taking it one week at a time. Sure. Because I, there's a lot, I mean, you guys know with the podcast, there's a lot of pre-production and there's a lot of post-production. So let me look at my calendar and then I can give you some absolute, oh, we're excited about Felix Oops. Calvieri from the Rascals. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. The Rascals are my boys when I was growing up, Blue Eyed yeah. Soul. Were you, were you ever a fan of the Tremolos? Do you remember the Tremolos at all? Mm -mm. Silence I, is Golden. Okay. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, we I interviewed his son, uh, Chesney Hawks. He had a hit song, "The One and Only," in 1991. He was a great guest because I've interviewed oh, wow. a lot of musician musical guests because I used to study the Billboard charts, you know, the uh, where they'd have the top 20 hits of the U.S. and U.K. Yeah. So I'd branch out yeah. into U.K. So I interviewed a lot of U.K. artists, and one of the most amazing guys that uh, I interviewed was Taco, who sang "Putting on the Ritz." Right. He was just wow. so down to earth. Like they they gave him the choice. Do you want to come over to US and do this type of thing? Or do you want to stay in Europe? And he was not, he he chose to stay in Europe because of that setting. He liked the setting a lot better than in the US. And it, wow. it was just yep. unreal to have him break down his whole story. And I and that was just me reaching yeah. out to him on Facebook. 
Well, Tim you Bruce know, Bruce you, a great you, guy. You, point to, you point to something that really makes our show fun, and that is discovering something about a talented person that you weren't aware of. For instance, uh, any of these people from uh, Happy Days, uh, they all have, you, you, or uh, Christopher Knight um, from the Brady, Brady Bunch. Bunch. Oh, cool. You, you, you have this preconception about who they're going to be like. You, you put a little of their TV character on them and think they're that or something else. But it's fun peeling back the layers and finding out they're deeper and far more interesting than that person on TV. And uh, I think you discover the same thing about some of these musical artists. And let me ask something with your podcast. Do you ever notice this? Because I noticed that when I have guests on, <coughs> like they, they immediately, like almost right after they come on, they have like a new project out and it's like blowing up. Like Taco did this song, uh, Hot Summer Jams. And he's still, he's still recording. And it was just unreal to see the number of hits on YouTube and to see that, you know, uh, the strong following for a guy like him. So you wow. gave him a good pop on Mark 2.0 and look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube's awesome. Do you guys have any problems with like censorship or anything? Talking politics and stuff? I don't think that censorship really kind of has affected podcasts because po podcasts are so uh they're kind of like uh sneaking onto the internet without like really kind of search engines uh yeah. detecting the content and mm. you know when they're on you know, different platforms and you know i guess ev eventually there'll be people responding to your podcast in a, in a certain type of way negatively mm. uh, did youtube get mad at you at all no, I mean we're not doing we're not saying anything controversial. I mean there's in our in our sure. country there's two political parties and there's people that kind of are consider themselves to be more conservative or more liberal but both are equally entitled to have their point of view. Fritz yeah. and I kind of go on, go towards the liberal side of things but you know we've had a lot of guests on our show that are conservatives and we we want to know how they feel. So yeah, we haven't said anything you know, I don't but think you have to say Wheezy. Wheezy post produces the show and really makes it visually a spectacular show. It's on YouTube as well. But what we can't do, for instance, we had Gary Puckett of Gary Puckett and the Union Gap on there. And it would have been cool to be able to do a little sliver of Young Girl or some of his songs. Oh, but yeah, YouTube okay. will flag you for rights if you put any music up, right, Wheezy? Yeah, but they're not going to flag you for opinions. No, yeah. no, I'm talking about stuff that you would get flagged. But for. they would, yeah, because if I would do an introduction, if I did like putting on the Ritz when Taco came on or the one and only when Chesney Hawk came on, no, you know, that's why we normally use a stock, yep. you know, uh, yep. song. You you guys get it perfectly. Yeah. yeah. So you got any plans, uh, special plans for the podcast in the near future you'd like to share? No, we're just going to keep on keeping on what we've been doing. We're looking for for guests, you know, we're both kind of, politically active. So we're looking for guests that as we get towards the election that are going to, you know, share a point of view that, you know, we hope will be uh, educational and interesting and informative uh, to, to folks. Um, but our you know, goal is just like yours. We want to grow an, our audience. And there are so many podcasts that it's a slow process and you can't overthink it. You can't look every day and see how you've grown. You just have to keep doing it building the product, working on the chemistry in the studio, and hope that people find it. And uh, you're pleasantly surprised after a while. Yeah, That's I mean, we, I love, so. we just kind of like buckle down and do our show. We're not, a, we're not a company, and so we don't have a master plan. We just want to make a great show every week and, and be responsive to our audience and listen to the folks. I mean, let them give us our feedback, and then that, that might kind of give us some direction. But aside from that, we're sort of homegrown, and so we just want to make a show that people find uh, entertaining and interesting. That's great. Right. Now, uh, well, explain how the two of you met. We didn't even touch upon that. Um, we met when 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 I went to see Fritz. He was doing his his first one man show. I mean, Fritz is a guy who can take this the art of stand up comedy and elevate it to the um, the art of theater. You know, which is a which is a higher bar. Now you have to make people laugh and cry and feel. And not just laugh, you know, so it's like all the emotions are involved. And he had he had mounted a one man play called It's Me, Dad, where mm -hmm. he's kind of like theoretically speaking to his kids that they'll they'll watch this tape when he when they're old enough 
um, because he 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 wants his kids to truly know him. He said, you know, because Fritz will tell you this story. He sat at the funeral of his dad. And you know how you've gone to a funeral and you've listened to people talk about the person and it's your uncle or something. And you're like, I never knew that, you know, <laughs> you know, he never said any of this stuff to me, but it's, it's really good to know. I'm glad I came to this funeral. I've learned a lot, but I met Fritz. It was a small theater and you could just walk up to the guy and say, Hey, have you ever thought of putting this on TV as, you know, like having celebrities with their dads kind of as a father's day special. So that's what we started talking. And mm. one thing led to another and I wound up producing his next play. And he, he can tell you more about that. Then we had a show called the reception, which uh, was me narrating an imaginary wedding reception. And I did it with 700 high definition photographs in a screen behind me. And we cast actors and we played out this entire drama in still photographs behind me as I was telling the story and Wheezy produced that show. We had some great success with that. But anyway, over time, our friendship grew. We have similar feelings about pop culture and books and politics and movies. And we've always enjoyed great conversation about that. And when I finally retired and I was freed up contractually to be able to do another project, Weezy just invited me on and it's been an amazing experience. We, we yeah. have 103 episodes and we've been doing it for almost two years. That's great. And we can tell that just like Brian and I, we can tell that the both of you really click well together on yeah, the show. The ones that I've listened to, they're just amazing. We have a good time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, we really appreciate you coming on the uh, Mark 2.0 podcast. Uh, you know, We're let our listeners here, know but... where we can uh, find your podcast at. Wherever you get your podcasts. And also we have a YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast, where you can watch it. You know, I add, that's what I was so busy doing today. I add a lot of visuals uh, so that if you, and you can watch a, a YouTube on your phone or on your TV and any, any format that you like, or you can just put it in your podcasting whatever podcasting app that you like to use click follow and every new episode will show up in your in your feed and uh we would love to have you join us that's all great right. we'll, we'll make sure to have your, down below. Post your links in the description and we are mark 2.0 make sure to subscribe to us on youtube or any podcasting platform we're looking forward to more great podcasts and we're looking forward to more great media path podcasts Thanks so we much for joining back us. Again. Hey, yeah, we're happy to be definitely. invited, guys. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having us. You guys us. are amazing. Awesome. We're, we're thrilled. Thank you. Thanks so right. much. Take care. We'll call. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.